Michelle Cavanaugh, co-host of the Pool Pro Podcast. We also have Dave Rockwell. Hi, everybody. Hey, and then we also are doing something a little bit different today. We're going to do a dual or a co-released podcast with Ask the Masters. We have Dave Penton from Ask the Masters podcast on today. Hey, Dave. Hey, how's it going? Uh, happy to be here, and and this is going to be a great conversation. Uh, you know, it's I always love the opportunity to interface with the service professionals in our industry, and so um, you know, I'm going to be here uh, representing the builders, and and uh, you know, for you builders out there that listen to our podcast, there's definitely things in here that you're going to want to that you're going to be able to pull out, um, and the whole thing may not be relevant to you, uh, but there's definitely I, I still encourage you to stay tuned and listen to the whole thing because there's there's really some some things and misconceptions that we're going to try and uh, knock down for you yeah we have a special guest today terry arco from hasa who's a i've known for a long long time was part of nspf and still a, a pHTA instructor now but we're excited to have you terry we're going to talk a lot about chlorine liquid chlorine source water and lots of things so we're excited to have you welcome Hey, good morning, uh, Michelle and Dave and uh, Dave, I guess I'll say, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. You bet. So Terry, what we wanted to talk about with you today is uh, you're kind of the chemistry guru, especially as it relates to liquid chlorine chemistry, but uh, we're especially going to focus today on how our source water uh, affects our water chemistry and how we treat our water, how we start up pools. And uh, so that's what we'd like to get into with you today. Yeah, great. Uh, actually, great subject. And it's a, uh, it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I, uh, first of all, just so you know, I, um, I started out as a, a pool service tech um, a long time ago in Southern California. That's what, that's what got me into all this. Um, and uh, so uh, I guess in, in a lot of ways, I, I dealt with water for most of my life. Um, and uh, I didn't really get into really thinking seriously about source water uh, until probably, I guess, maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, and I was working actually for a water company. I was working for a company that actually made portable disinfection treatment uh, systems. Uh, and they were selling them primarily into India. Uh, and uh, somebody gave me a book called The Blue Death. This is what got me on the source water kick, <laughs> and I've, I've been on it ever since, but they gave me a book. It sounds like a terrifying name. It's called The Blue Death. It was written by an epidemiologist or a scientist called Robert Morris, uh, and basically in that book, he just traced how sort of all the great public health, I guess, issues or tragedies uh, were really born out of source water. And he went back to the 1850s to London back in the day when they had no concept or no idea uh, of germs or bacteria or that, that that could even be spread in water. In fact, uh, back then they thought that uh, they had outbreaks of cholera and they were blaming the outbreaks of cholera basically from odor in the air, from stink in the air. They didn't have real good sewage systems at that time. Uh, and then uh, sewage began to reek through the ground into the River Thames and then put the cholera, and they were using that same water for drinking water. Oh, geez. So uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. It talks about that. It talks about uh, one of the biggest major crypto outbreaks in the U.S., uh, 403,000 people in Milwaukee in 1993 oh, that were sickened from drinking water. Drink this was coming in from the tap. And it was crypto. And as we know, in the pool industry, we've learned a lot, especially in public pools about crypto and how crypto is chlorine resistant. Um, so it takes a lot of chlorine to inactivate uh, a crypto cyst or germ. Uh, and they actually found and discovered that um, the, the source of the crypto that got in that drinking water in Milwaukee was basically from cow feces that had frozen into the snow in the winter. And then when that snow melted and went into Lake Michigan, and it was just above the treatment center, that crypto went into the treatment center and the chlorine they were using was not enough to, uh, to inactivate it. And it sickened people. So um, that it just from that standpoint, I started reading more, I started researching more about source water. And I thought, you know, it's really important uh, to understand our source water. And uh, then, you know, later on, I began to do some other research 
uh, finding out that the EPA, um, who mandates source water and, you know, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, they actually have uh, instituted uh, for municipalities what they call a uh, corrosion control uh, mandate. Um, and so basically what that means is uh, the pipes underneath the ground that are delivering the water into our homes and our swimming pools um, are very old, some of them, very old. They're, they're, they're uh, galvanized, you know, they're, some of them are very old uh, metal and they're, and they're beginning to corrode. Uh, it's very costly to replace those pipes. Yep. So EPA has mandated what they call con con corrosion control uh, and municipalities have to practice this. And a big factor of their corrosion control is using orthophosphates, using an ingredient that puts orthophosphates into the pipes and lines the pipes with orthophosphates. And uh, now uh, that they've mandated that and the majority of facilities are practicing this, uh, you have phosphate coming out. And, and so I was led to look into that because we at the time sold phosphate removers we were beginning phosphate removal was beginning to become something new in the pool industry. And I actually had pool techs, service techs who were reporting to me that the phosphates in their pools were just strangely going up. And it usually or typically was around the time that they topped off or filled the pool. So, so you, you brought in a couple of rabbit holes we can go down, but the, the phosphate issue I, I encounter in LA all the time. They, they don't do it all the time. They do it in, in spurts, it seems like. Correct. It, like you'll go through a, a relative peaceful time uh, in your fight with algae, and then all of a sudden it'll bloom and you test for phosphates, and like sure enough, they've, they've run phosphate through the system. We know the corroding pipes is a problem because Sunset Boulevard is tore up frequently in different places when the pipes break. Um, so that, that is, that's, that's a huge issue and that is something. So that brings up, uh, a question of how often do you think of pool tech, once a pool is full, once it's started up, balanced, everything's great. How often should we test our source water apart from the pool water? So I, uh, when I teach water temperature classes and so forth, basically I, you know, my sort of general rule of thumb if it's residential guys, I'm going to tell them at least seasonally, um, they should be, you know, so I'm, I'm talking like maybe winter, spring, fall, three times or so. Four, a year. Four, they three, should. And, times. And, and definitely seasonally, I will tell you water changes quite a bit based on the seasons. Um, I can just an example up here. I'm up in Seattle, Washington state area. And, uh, you know, up here, we have a lot of growth up here because <laughs> we have mm -hmm. a lot of rain. We yeah. have a lot of trees. Uh, and in the fall, uh, we get a lot of leaves that dump. And I, I can tell you, like my street sometimes is buried in leaves. And those leaves are going down into the system and they're washing down into the system. And those leaves are, in, are ending up in a lot of the municipality drinking. So, so there's a lot of tannins, things like that, that are being introduced. So that's just one seasonal thing that happens that changes the basically the makeup and the structure of your source water. Um, winter time, the water's colder, so there's different reactions. In summer, things are changing. So, so definitely seasonally. Um, I also say in some cases, if it's a drought, if you're in the middle of a drought, you might want to, uh, it, it might be weekly, it might be monthly that you're, that you're checking it. Uh, because water levels are changing. Uh, water sources are changing. Um, you know, during, during the last drought they had in California, uh, in the uh, Bay Area, uh, Northern Cal Bay area, uh, they basically switched their water overnight. Their water source was switched overnight. They were taking it from the estuary, uh, but the water was going low. So they started pumping it in from Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Completely mm -hmm. different water, completely right. different water change. That so, happens down here in Southern California too, though. They uh, used to get a lot of their water from the Colorado River, and that would be a lot higher in calcium, and a lot uh, different makeup of the water. And then when they switch to buying it from Northern California, we get a lot lower calcium hardness and a lot more aggressive water uh, coming in. So let me bring in the builder's perspective here a little sure. bit. Um, uh, so as a builder, uh, you know, 
why can't I just, you know, turn this over? Do I need to be paying attention as a builder? Because, um, you know, uh, once the water's in the pool, I want to just be able to pawn it off on the pool guy. And, uh, but, but listening to you guys talk about it, um, it seems like it's really important for me as a builder to understand uh, kind of what the source water is. Not only, um, you know, as we're filling that pool on the initial startup, uh, but even, um, even potentially uh, how much calcium is in the water that we're using at that particular property when we're mixing the plaster and everything. So can you kind of understand or can you kind of explain a little bit um, yeah. what, uh, how, how source water affects plaster, plaster dust, um, and then uh, potentially your pool even in that first couple of days? Sure, absolutely. Um, really vital. And I think, uh, I think for any builder, um, to wherever they're at, uh, when you're doing a job, finishing a job, uh, definitely knowing the makeup of that source water is, is going to be really vital. And as, as you pointed out, Dave, I think it's vital from the standpoint of knowing, is that water really soft? So is it lacking in calcium? Is it lower in calcium? Uh, which means that water, when you have soft water, water that's low in any kind of mineral, uh, water naturally desires or naturally craves to be balanced. It, it, it wants a certain amount of mineral. And if it doesn't have it, it's going to try and obtain it from any source it can get. So plaster, I mean, is a, that's like a feast. It's a banquet for soft water, you know, calcium, magnesium. Those are two, two primary ingredients, I believe. So, um, you know, at any point, at any time, when you're mixing that or whatever, there's definitely, if you're doing that with soft water, um, it's going to, it's going to affect, you know, what's in that plaster. And, and certainly when the pool's plastered, it's definitely going to start to, uh, pull that calcium up through the top of the, um, you know, the plat or the surface of the plaster. So, uh, just, just from that standpoint, it's important, but I can give you a couple other, uh, things that I, I work with builders and I think just understanding and knowing the source water and not assuming, uh, I had a builder up here in Seattle and, uh, they built a pool got it all ready to go. And, and, and this builder, they would do a little initial testing, um, you know, before they turned it over to a pool company to do the startup. And one of the tests they would always do is they'd test for metals to see what the metals were um, as well. And in this case, uh, there was some assumption going on and they did some of their initial tests. They do an iron test, found out, oh, no iron. Uh, and they also were assuming that this was um, softer water uh, because they were assuming it was river water. Uh, that we have a lot up here, a lot of sources up here. So they filled the pool, kind of took care of what they needed, turned it over to a service company for startup. And that service company did, they did their due diligence. Uh, but once they got to the point of adding the sanitizer and the chlorine, poured the chlorine in, the entire pool turned root beer brown. Didn't know wow. why. And then suddenly, suddenly they're, they're, they're finding high levels of iron. Uh, so what we realized, we did research and we realized that actually this was in a, na a neighborhood in Washington, Redmond, Washington, where uh, on one side of the street, the water was pulling from the river, pulling from a river. But if you cross the street, the houses across the street were pulling from wells, deep wells. And those wells were very low because it was summertime. And what they actually found was there was iron bacteria in the bottom of some of those wells that was coming up to the source water. So it was bacteria that was attached to iron. So when you did the test initially, you didn't pick up any iron. Uh, but once they put the chlorine in and that bacteria, cl chlorine kills bacteria, the bacteria died and it released the iron, lots of iron and, and caused the pool to turn brown. Wow. Uh, but there and again is a situation where they didn't really test the source water or they didn't, they didn't know the source of the water. They assumed, hey, this house across the street's on the river, so this must be on the river too. Yeah, and I just want to um, uh, kind of uh, talk about the the relationship a little bit between builder and service guy, um, because in something like that, uh, it, it's very easy for the builder to just say, oh, the service guy messed up. Uh, he must sure, have thrown yeah. something in there. And, um, you know, many of you that have been around the podcast, uh, uh, both of our podcasts know that Dave Rockwell does most of my service and startup and everything on the pools that I build. And as a builder, I think it becomes a critical relationship to make sure that you and your service guy are on uh, very good terms with each other because something like that, uh, if you're throwing that in the lap of the service guy and you're throwing the service guy under the bus to your client, you're actually doing a disservice to every 
everybody. And, and so um, understanding those relationships is really a, a key component uh, because keeping those lines of communication open, uh, I'm sure in that situation was very critical to understand that, yeah. that this wasn't a maintenance or a service guy screw up in any way. Uh, it just, it was what it was. So, um, so yeah, Absolutely. thanks. That's a really great story. No, absolutely. And it, it, it's very vital that, you know, we got to work together. And uh, fortunately, in this situation, uh, everybody was professional. Everybody was just trying to solve the problem. There was no finger pointing, no blame. And uh, I think that allowed us to actually get to the point where we, we were able to find out what we did. So that's a good, that, very good point. Yeah, that relationship, absolutely. The relationship between a builder and a service person to me is highly important. I work for different types of builders. Um, guys like Dave care deeply about their projects. I mean, they're on, they're, they're on these jobs a lot of times for years. And so it, it's kind of like their baby. And, and when they hand it over, it doesn't mean they get their final check and they're, they're done looking at the pool. A lot of mass market builders don't want to be bothered, don't want to hear about it after the fact. And only when there's an extreme problem where they get dragged in, they're at that point they're kind of like, hey, hey, what happened? You know why? Because they've had no communication with the service company. So I think um, one of the things that we talk about all the time is how, how important relationships are in this yeah. in this industry, and uh, having a working relationship. When I when I start up a pool, I send Dave a text that that has all the parameters, the LSI parameters of the source water and then the next as soon as I measure the pool once it's full uh, I do that I keep him in the loop as, as we're starting up the pool so that he can document this and because if it comes back to there's a plaster problem then he's got the information he needs as well mm -hmm. yeah you know I I, uh, I recommend to builders and I recommend the service techs um, you know to first of all, uh, know where the water's coming from, you know, and to know, okay, is it this certain municipality? Is it this facility where, you know, you, you've got to address that. And I encourage builders, I encourage service techs to find out the municipality for the source of the water you're coming from. And you can go online or you can go there or you can address it and you can get a report from that facility on uh, the makeup of the water, pH, alkalinity, the calcium, everything they do to treat that water, if there was any particular contaminants at any particular time at certain levels. I mean, you can get a really good overall picture of the source water and they're actually required to provide that to anybody you ask. Um, and, I, and I encourage you do that just from a standpoint of looking, you know, where's this water coming from? What are some of the contaminants that have been reported and, and dealt with? Um, it just helps you to kind of start off on the right foot, I think. Yeah, I, we get that from our water district here at the house all the time. About four times a year, we get a report of, of everything that's in the water. And it, I think that's a, a, an important relationship for full service techs to, to build a relationship with their water district and, and get those reports yeah. and know what's going on. Because there are other things in the water other than just things that affect the LSI. Um, the, I, I follow Aaron Brockovich, who's an activist for, for clean water. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's another one. <laughs> and uh, she's um, constantly posting about different towns. Uh, there are contaminants we don't think of in our water. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, agricultural runoff, uh, pesticides, fertilizers, prescription drugs that get flushed down the toilet or that run through our bodies and end up in the sewer systems. And a lot of times, even the the, the, sewer, the water treatment systems don't have the the means to treat the worst case scenario of these things. You mentioned the the Milwaukee that was happening. That was a yearly thing when I lived in Colorado and in, in, in Vail. They they tell people don't drink the tap water every spring for exactly that reason. The snow melts it, it over overpopulates the river with giardia. Mm -hmm. And uh, the drinking water plant just can't handle it. Yeah, and I'll tell you, um, you know, I use that one example about the, the iron bacteria situation, but I'll tell you another one too that we've come across, and that is um, now a lot of these municipalities are practicing what they call chloramination. Um, so actually what they're doing is they're creating, they're creating chloramines. Now, you know, Dave, you know, in pools, we try and keep chloramines out of the pool. 
Right. Um, and uh, now a lot of your municipalities are actually taking chemical ammonia and chlorine and mixing those to create chloramines. And, and the purpose of that is um, to allow the chlorine to kind of, it, it's a slower release of chlorine. Chloramines right. are kind of very long lasting. And, and so to keep the chlorine residual in the pipes until it gets to the house, that disinfectant. But the problem is now you're putting that in the pool and you're putting chloramines. Primarily they're, uh, they're monochloramines um, that are going in, but you can, they can convert to dichloramines. So they can really, if you're doing a major fill or if you're topping off a lot in your pools, this is where I come across this. And I come across it a lot with public pools primarily where they're indoor pools that are just having uh, severe chloramine issues, which are causing odors in the facility and that kind of thing. Uh, and then we come to find out that they're doing quite a bit of top off because they get they get a lot of splash out or whatever's going on, uh, and the uh, their municipality is doing chlorination, and they don't recognize that. So they may even be topping off, and they're they're not adding any additional chlorine. They're not, they're just assuming you know, hey, I've got to fill the pool up. They do it, and then now their their combines are going up and up and up odors are being created and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another one. I actually worked with a, with a, a YMCA facility. They were having issues. And then I, I just asked the guy, I said, hey, contact your municipality and ask them if they're doing chlorination. He did. And sure enough, found out and they gave him the levels. They gave him everything. And once he recognized that, uh, when he did his top offs and when he filled, he knew that he had to do that at sort of an off time when there weren't swimmers around. Uh, and then he would, you know, he would have to add some some liquid chlorine uh, enough to where it would break up those monochloramines, and he didn't have the problem. Interesting. Well, another thing that um, there's there's more to it even than just the source water uh, on how a new pool can get contaminated, and the the pool that Dave and I are working on right now starting up. Uh, is a perfect example of that. This house was under construction for what, Dave, two, three years? And yeah, it, we, we did the underground plumbing on this uh, at least two and a half years ago. So it's been sitting under pressure for two and a half years. So with, with wow. water sitting stagnant in there. So the oh, minute boy. you prime those pumps and fire it up, the, the whole area is permeated by a rotten egg smell. <laughs> and uh, so, I think, uh, especially for the service, that's where the, the service guy in the pool builder need to really have that communication and uh, so that the service guy knows that this is, this is what happened, this is what's going on. And uh, enzymes, I think, are a big, big key to, to treating that. When Absolutely. I started this pool up and got, got it going, put enzymes in the, if it's a vanishing edge pool, put enzymes in the search tank, put enzymes in the spotter to get them through the spa jet lines. But if you don't clean that out, you've got to start for biofilm and you'll fight that for forever. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a tough one. And I've dealt with that somewhat too, even, well, I've dealt with that even in some situations where uh, they've got a spa or a pool and a public facility, a very old facility, and maybe they haven't been running it. And then, and then they, or, you know, they go through the season, it's not running, then they start it up and uh, you just get a ton of debris and so forth from those pipes um, that comes through and it, it can really wreak havoc and just cause discoloration, stains, all kinds of things. So they have to be prepared for that. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, guys are using variable speed pumps to save energy and they're that using too. big pipes. And so um, the water doesn't necessarily move through the pipe fast enough to really scrub that if it has started a biofilm. So you need to, uh, to run the pump speeds up a little bit and kind of, kind of scrub that off occasionally too. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any better movement, um, I think from time to time is just needed overall. Yes. Can we transit? I, I, last time we spoke, Terry, and just so you all know, we had a great uh, interview with Terry, what, a couple of months ago now, Terry, and then yeah. Yeah, we had to scrap I, it because we had some audio issues that came up later, but you were really speaking on that last, we, we talked a lot about liquid chlorine and kind of the history of it and how it's really prevented lots of things and outbreaks in the U.S., and I thought that was fascinating. Can you just talk a little bit about that, what we, what we spoke about last time? 
Sure. Um, and I, I just, you know, I love kind of talking about the fact that uh, I, I think everybody sort of refers to it as liquid chlorine uh, in yeah. the pool industry. And uh, I just love to, to really state that uh, that's kind of a misnomer. It's really not liquid chlorine. It's a, it's a chlorinating compound. Mm -hmm. And uh, liquid chlorine is a part of it, but it's basically what we call sodium hypochlorite. Um, and pretty simple. I mean, it's made, starts off with salt and salt is converted with water and electrolysis and we create liquid chlorine. And then they add some sodium hydroxide uh, to it as well, which balances out the pH more. Uh, and it really, uh, it really is the, the end product is basically what we would refer to as bleach. Right. Um, so, so pool liquid chlorine is basically a concentra concentrated strength of uh, like household bleach, what you would get in the, in the market. So if you think of household bleach, it's about 6% strength. Um, and uh, the liquid, like like uh, somebody, if they're using liquid chlorine, a Hasa liquid or something, it's 12.5%. So it's over twice the twice the strength. And um, you know, bleach has a has a fascinating history to begin with. It goes back to the 1700s, um, and sodium hypochlorite goes back to the 1700s, being used for the prevention of widespread disease and things like that. It was used in London uh, in the Thames to prevent cholera. Um, here in the U.S., going back to drinking water, um, there were thousands and thousands of cases yearly in the 1900s of, of just of cholera and typhoid, those kinds of things, and and a lot of um, uh, you know a lot of uh, deaths as a result of that um, until they started to treat drinking water. And uh, sodium hypochlorite was one of the primary things they used for treating drinking water. And as a result of that. Uh, you had basically the death rate of typhoid fever from 1920, uh, thousands of deaths per year to getting up to around into the 1960s, you had one or two maybe annually as right. a result of that. So it really worked from that standpoint. Um, the other thing that I think is really fascinating is I read an article recently um, about in San Diego, the cases of hepatitis A. Um, from uh, the surge in homeless, you know, that's a tragic thing in our day right now, but lots of homeless people in the streets. And of course, lots of things happening in the streets now. Um, so a lot of bacteria being spread. And they had, a, they had a, in, uh, I believe the summer of uh, 2014, it was skyrocketing cases of, of hepatitis A. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that the city did to quell that uh, outbreak of hepatitis A was they began a practice of washing the streets down with sodium hypochlorite, liquid bleach, uh, to do that. And as a result of that, a lots of other streets like LA, Long Beach, Pasadena, different areas now have that practice of washing their streets down uh, with sodium hypochlorite. And so I think that the cool thing about, that I just like about bleach is the fact, I mean, I know a lot of us, we've been using it in our pools for a long time. And I think that over the time and throughout history, bleach is kind of, it was primary for a while, then it got pushed away because, you know, tablets and, you know, things like that, floaters, feeders, more convenience or whatever, then it became more of a shock and that kind of thing. But I think just the importance of really seeing that um, if you look at any kind of catastrophe, any kind of disaster, hurricanes, earthquakes, things like that, where um, sanitized water is needed, uh, liquid sodium hypochlorite is the first and preferred uh, form of chlorine that's going to get sent to wherever that's happening. And if you look at the CDC pages, uh, you look at the WHO, uh, water quality um, associations, different things like that, they all recommend um, for disinfecting your water, drinking water, cleaning up flood waters, cleaning up your house, your home from mold, those kinds of things. Uh, it's liquid sodium hypochlorite is what does the job for that. So I think it's a pretty cool and pretty utilized product. Terry, I have a question on that because uh, as a builder, um, you know, oftentimes I'm, I'm meeting with clients uh, initially uh, to discuss their desires and that. Um, and a, a couple of things, I, I, I have two questions. Um, you know, we, we hear so often, and, and I know the service guys hear this so often too, that, well, I'm allergic to chlorine. Um, mm -hmm. And my understanding is that rate of allergic reaction to chlorine is so infinitesimally small um, that, that it's, it's more usually a reaction to 
imbalance in the water. Can you yeah. talk about that just for a sec? So that yeah. I, as a builder, can yeah, explain absolutely. that to my clients. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think what you know, it's not so much uh, chlorine that they're allergic to as it is the byproducts that yep. can be from chlorine. And the one in particular I can tell you, which can cause some uh, pretty severe allergic reactions, is if they if they are at a point or if for whatever reasons um, they have some majorities of uh, we call them trichloramines, or um, it, it's also referred to as THM trihalomethane. Um, which, by the way, in drinking water municipalities, uh, they work very hard uh, to ensure there's no uh, trihalomethanes present in the water at all, because they do cause irritation, they cause skin, skin problems, disease, lung problems, eye problems, um, uh, lots of things. And uh, so I, I agree with that. I think it's byproducts that are more, more so causing these irritation, skin irritation, things like that. Um, as opposed to just the pure chlorine um, in the water. Well, and, and talk a little bit about, um, you know, we've been talking about how, how chlorine is beneficial and, and essentially it is one of the elements that has kind of wiped out some of these um, ailments that have, have plagued society for many, many years. Uh, you know, we get the pushback from clients so much of, wow, chlorine's dangerous and that. And we, right. you know, it seems like we're coming out of that a little bit, but it seemed like for like the last decade, chlorine had such a bad name. I think some of it was perpetrated by the salt manufacturers uh, as they were, you know, salt systems were coming more online and <laughs> salespeople were uh, really kind of misleading clients. Uh, yep. And some of that still sticks. And so yep. um, can you kind of tutor me a little bit as a builder, how to sure. talk to my client and tell them, uh, you know, and, and uh, that chlorine is actually a really good thing. Yeah, and I, it, first of all, I, I laugh when you talk about the uh, salt manufacturers yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and their thing of safety when, it, when it's like, a, it, what they really didn't tell people is that, hey, we're putting a small chlorine manufacturing plant uh, on your pool. I mean, the right. end result is still chlorine, which is safe chlorine, by the way, again. And, you know, the one thing I'll, I always say, there's, there, man, there is so much misunderstanding and so much misnomers about chlorine and out in the public. And, of course, we won't get into the media and things like that about chlorine and the safety of chlorine. Uh, but I always say that um, uh, chlorine used properly um, is probably one of the safest, most efficient ways that you can deal with um, not only bacteria, not only viruses, things like that, but just overall contaminants, um, non-living contaminants, um, oxidation. It's one of the best sanitizers, disinfectors, oxidizers that we have available. And, the, and I still think the safest. Uh, where we run into problems uh, is uh, with the misuse, um, the mishandling um, of chlorine, uh, things like that. So uh, where it's either not used properly, uh, in, in other words, not enough is used, um, there's not proper oxidation. Uh, I think, you know, the pool industry is, is just you know, we've gone milestones and, and just advanced so much um, with these things like ozone and UV, uh, those kinds of things to help out with the oxidation of chlorine, because I think a lot of times people are not using chlorine in the proper method to where they're getting the sanitation and they're getting the proper oxidation and proper ORP and everything. So I think that's a big part of it. I think also um, where we run into problems is when it's misused, when it's mixed improperly, uh, I think some of the biggest chlorine issues really aren't specifically chlorine issues uh, in public pools. I see where, um, you know, there's improper interlock uh, and you have muriatic acid mixing with chlorine and now you're creating, you know, a, a chlorine gas, uh, which causes problems. You know, I remember, um, you know, just back when I was uh, servicing pools, I had people that uh, just because of something they read, uh, they felt like chlorine was just, just evil. And they, they, they thought I was going to kill their dog, you know, if my right. dog drinks the pool. And, you know, I would very politely have to say, um, you do realize that the water coming out of your tap could have up to four parts per million of chlorine in it. And that we've been drinking this water safely and animals have been drinking it since the 1920s. Um, but I just think there's you know that, that kind of thing goes around yeah terry that's a that's a, a 
a point that I have when I talk to customers who say they're allergic to chlorine. True chlorine allergy is is incredibly rare. Uh, I agree. Maybe, maybe even non-existent uh, I agree. in people's minds. But um, the first thing I ask them is, well, what do you what do you have for a whole house water treatment system? What do you have removing the chlorine from your your source water? Because when you're standing in the shower, you're going to inhale more yep. chlorine, especially where, where, the, where chloramines are used in the treatment you're gonna expose yourself to more chlorine potentially than you could in your pool. Now, a lot of the issues that, um, that people have with chlorine is the way that it's dosed and the way that it's managed. Correct. And, and so there's a whole debate about the amount of cyanuric acid that should be in the pool. And I, I don't think we have time to really get into that here. <laughs> That'll other be another than, one. <laughs> other than to say, um, you know, the, the way that so many pools are managed once a week, all the chlorine for that week is, is added. And that's, right. that's why tabs and dichlor and those types of compounds became popular, but you have a very, very short sweet spot in time during the week when you really have the ideal amount of chlorine in the pool, the rest of the time you either got, if the pool is being used, you either have too much or too little. Yep. Sure. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, the EPA mandate for chlorine is one to four PPM. Um, on, on a public realm, it's, it should be one to no higher than four PPM. Um, so, I mean, let's just think about that. How many pools do we know are running higher than four PPM? Um, how many pools we know? I mean, I can tell you, I always tell the story about when my son went to a water park, uh, you know, with his youth group or whatever, and uh, I could smell him, smell him coming home two blocks away. Mm -hmm. uh, before he got in the house, I could smell him. And when he came in, he, he almost, you know, his hair was blonde, almost. And uh, I, I went to this water park, I talked to the operator, I found out they kept their chlorine at 10 ppm or above. Wow. All the time. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that's going to just react and it's going to bleach things out. And, and that's where you run into problems. Um, so I think it, it really, it's misuse. And, and that's where I think education comes into play, you know, yeah. things like, um, you know, CPO and, uh, you know, CPSA, all the things we do, you know, to educate people on um, the proper use of chlorine, the proper use of water. And, and, and again, I think the reason why I'm so passionate about source water and understanding source water um, I'm also really a person who's passionate about dilution. Um, and I know it's a weird thing. And I know in the U.S. everybody freaks out about water and water use and droughts and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I, again, I just think from the standpoint of chemicals and, and health and safety, um, some, some just some good proactive practice of diluting water and keeping that water fresher, the quality, I mean, when you talk about things like high TDS, high calcium hardness, high byproducts, all those things that collect, those all affect humans. It all affects their eyes, their skin, and those kinds of things. And that's where we have the problems. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you, you mentioned that there is salt in, in liquid chlorine as a, that's yep. a component of the chemical compound. Also, muriatic acid, there's salt in that as well, right? Correct. Well, muriatic acid is a byproduct of uh, making liquid chlorine. So, right. so in terms of something uh, we can kind of relate to, say we have a gallon of liquid chlorine, how many pounds of salt are in that bottle? Well, so typically the kind of standard on that is a pound of salt per gallon of chlorine. And how about muriatic? Uh, you know, muriatic, I'm not so sure about. Uh, I, it, it's not a pound, I can tell you that. It's less. Uh, I just, right off the top of my head, don't know how much less uh, it, it is. And see, I found that out the hard way. I was managing a pool back in the 80s, before salt generators really came onto the scene. And it had an automatic dosing system. It was an 80,000 gallon country club pool that was wall-to-wall -wall kids. So we were pumping a ton of liquid chlorine. And within six months to less than a year, 
were getting complaints that the pool tasted like ocean water. <laughs> they were tasting salt. I'm like, what the heck? Why would that? And I, I, so I, I bought a, a, a salt uh, sodium chloride test kit and measured it. And sure enough, I had 4,000 parts per million of salt and I hadn't added a pound of it. It, it, it came from the liquid chlorine. Yeah, you could have put a uh, salt generator on that system and just kicked it in, and you would have been good. <laughs> well, I started right. doing that later on on pools. It's, if you're gonna if you're gonna add that salt, you might as well put it to use and 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 yeah. Cut down and you know, this is again, Dave. You know, this is again why, why I'm kind of a proponent of dilution too. You know, I mean, you do yeah. need to do some dilution in whatever you're using, and so you know, and I, and I get people that I, I know somebody said this to me once somewhere, like they said, well. Um, liquid chlorine doesn't work because all you're doing is you're putting salt in the pool. And um, I had to kind of scratch my head a little bit on that. You know, like, what do you mean? He said, well, it's just, it just, it's just going to turn into salt and salt doesn't do anything. <laughs> and I was kind of like, okay, well, first of all, it, there is some sanitation and disinfection taking place <laughs> first before, before that all <laughs> happens, you know, and, and, and it does, you know, but the thing about it is, so that's increasing TDS. And I, you know, again, as I said, I'm a put, you got to watch your TDS and you've got to dilute. Okay. That's fine. Uh, but let's look at some of the others. So let's look at, you know, so if you look at trichlor, okay. Um, you're putting six parts per million of cyanuric acid for every 10 PPM of trichlor and that doesn't go away. And that's contributing to TDS. Okay. Calcium, if you're using calcium, calcium hypochlorite, okay, you're putting about eight PPM for every, you know, 10 PPM of calcium hardness into the pool. That doesn't go away. That, that rises. That's a part of TDS. And so when I, when people bring this thing up to me about liquid and all, oh, you know, the TDS and all the salt and everything, I, I, I kind of say, well, okay, look, if you've got really high levels of CYA, and particularly if you're a public pool, uh, you're going to be mandated. You've got to keep that CYA managed and you've got to drain a lot more to manage that CYA, correct? Rather yeah. than just chloride salt. Okay. Right. Um, calcium, the same thing. And if your calcium levels go too high and you've got a heater, um, you're really risking that you're going to create calcium car carbonate on that heat exchanger and you're going to ruin heat exchangers, which is much more costly. And there's more draining involved as well. So I kind of, from that scenario, I say, hey, look, yeah, liquid's going to contribute some salt, sodium chloride, TDS, okay? I look at that as that's probably the least detrimental form of TDS you can have in the pool as compared yeah. to CYA or calcium. That's right. Um, one of the things, getting back to the builder uh, relationship here, and it's something that Dave does on every single pool, is he provides a chlorine and pH dosing system uh, an automated system, even on, and everybody says, oh, it's commercial pools only. Uh, on residential pools, the best way to manage TDS and, and, and chlorine and all the chlorine problems, to my way of thinking, the best way to do it is to dose properly. And yes. these systems dose two ounces a minute uh, or a little more. And uh, the, the chlorine levels stay consistent, they stay right, they, you can maintain them at a lot lower residual, which means the less chlorine you pump, the less salt you're adding, the, le the less sure. Uh, um, sure. TDS. And so the one good thing in my way of thinking that salt systems did for our industry was it got people used to spending a certain amount of money on a water treatment system added at the equipment pad. Well, yeah. now for just slightly more uh, more money than, than a salt system, you can completely control your pH, you can dose the chlorine properly, and, and you can still have a freshwater pool. Yeah. And, and Dave puts I agree. It on every one of his pools, and his pools are a dream to service because of that. It's, it, yeah. it just takes away so many problems. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm a big proponent of automation and uh, of uh, you know feeders. Thing, anything that makes something foolproof, where you don't have to depend so much, uh, at least day in and day out, on the the possibility of human error, because <laughs> I think that's yeah. a big factor. Um, you know, I think that's a big factor from uh, just service tax. Who, uh, I mean, I, it goes back to training again, and it goes back yep. to education. And I always tell my story. I always tell my story. You know, when I started out servicing pools, which was a long time ago, you know, I was trained by a guy who, who told me, "Yeah, just drop the reagents in the pool, and look at the flash." 
and and, uh, and if you if it if it flashes this much, put in a, a quart. If it flashes this much, put in a gallon. I mean, the guy was an alchemist. You know, I mean, it's like or I don't know, a guru or something. But that's how I was trained. You know, so I think training and education and understanding go a long ways. And I, that's how I was trained too. And and I as I began to as I got better test kits and I learned what you can. Uh, really ascertain from a flash test. If it turns yellow, yes, there is chlorine in the water. <laughs> if it, if, if you drop yeah. the, you drop the, uh, the, the phenol red in there, and like, yes, there is pH in the water as well. But yeah. as far as anything meaningful, um, if, if you're still doing that, you're, you're not serious about your craft. That, that's, no, that's, and yeah. I mean, and, and we talk about that and laugh about that now, Dave, and it, it, it seems like the stone age or archaic, um, compared to what we have today. I mean, today we have so much with, with you know, digital devices, digital testing, um, phone apps. I mean, good night. If I had had phone apps that could tell me how to dose and so forth, or even figure out my Langley or saturation index when I was doing pools, uh, you know, I think, you know, my hair wouldn't be as gray as it is now, you know. Um, <laughs> it's just, it, it, hey, it's Dave, so much, I was going to ask the so question to Penn. Uh, Penn, what is it? What are the percentage of builders that are actually specking in automation systems? Is that becoming more and more popular? Is that not, is it just the big builders that are doing that? Who, how many builders are doing that? You know, I think it's still, um, I think it's still at the high end. Uh, and I think, um, you know, some of the manufacturers are really trying to bring that down into more of the residential market. Um, sure. And, yeah. you know, as a builder, I think you just need to educate yourself um, uh, a little bit to be able to explain it to your clients. Uh, and the way I explain it to clients is simply that um, I can give you perfectly balanced water seven days a week, 365 days a year, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, if you, if you have your service guy come in and he's coming in and he's only here one, maybe two times a week on your typical pool, um, you know, you've got these big, undulations in your chemical quality and sure. then you know you throw uh, you throw an entire soccer team in there on a Saturday after the pool guy's been there on Friday because you're a good customer and you have Friday service the, the kind of the premier by Monday there's no chlorine in there and so it becomes really easy as a builder to sell the system um, especially now that uh, if you do your research there are systems out there that are yeah, there may be 50% more than a salt system, uh, but the clients almost invariably always talk to us about a salt system uh, because they all have heard that. And, and to take them to the next step to full automation is not as difficult as it seems um, because like right. Dave said, everybody's wanting to, uh, you know, they're, they're expecting that there's going to be some sort of an upcharge there. Um, so I think we're starting to see it really come down into more the, uh, the mainstream marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I really, I really think that um, as we're learning some of the dangers of cyanuric acid and that, um, you know, and as builders, you really need to kind of do some of that research. It becomes a more compelling argument that you can make to, to the end user and to your client that automation is it's it's very beneficial and and it becomes easy to sell the more you understand the systems and for people who are trying to minimize their exposure to chlorine yeah um you're going to expose yourself to a lot more chlorine in a salt pool potentially than than a properly dosed chemically automated pool you you can keep the the uh, chlorine levels very steady at a part per million or maybe even a little less based on the orp uh, with a salt system, it, it's a, a dumb machine in that it's not, it has no intelligence built into it. It doesn't measure the water. It doesn't dose according to what's going on in the water. It doses according to the percentage that you set. And that percentage means that you set it for 60% out of every hour, that's going to be on 60% of the time. This is very similar to a roller chem with a dial on it, uh, a chemical pump with no control on it is just going to pump when it, uh, based on a, on a timer and it has nothing to do with what's actually going on in the water. So there's going to be times when there's way too much chlorine in the water or times when there's not enough. Um, a, a, a 
proper ORP based dosing system is really the, the best way to keep just the right amount of chlorine in a pool. Right. Yeah, and I think uh, I was going to say, David, David Penton, um, you know, I talked about training and education, and I think that training and education goes to the consumer uh, as well. And I think that's that the fact that you're doing that is just fantastic. I mean, that's what we need to do. We need to educate. And, and you know, we have consumers that are a lot more savvy. They're a lot more. I mean, we have the Internet. We have all these things. They can check things out. And sometimes they can get the wrong information as well by checking that out. But, you know, it's great to have guys like you to educate them, to tell them. And, and just in my last kind of uh, note that I'll say here, too, is. Uh, I can't stress enough that, you know, as far as exposure to the wrong type of chlorine or combined chlorine or higher levels of chlorine. Uh, and again, you know, I'm just, I'll put my little plug in that I'm a fan of liquid, you know, because uh, the higher you've got to keep that cyanuric acid or the higher that cyanuric acid is, uh, the higher the chlorine levels have to be um, that people are exposed to. So managing that in a rollicum feeder or something like that is just a, a really great idea. Yeah. yeah, and I'll just make one quick point here on this. Um, the consumer is, they've, they've gotten to the point now where automation is a part of their life. So it's not sure. as tough a sell anymore. You have Nest sure. thermostats that know when you're home or when you're coming home and things like that. So they're becoming more accustomed to having these systems that do exactly what they want them to do. Uh, you know, the Google home, all of those yeah. things. So yeah. it's, it's uh, for the builders out there that are really concerned with, well, how am I going to sell this, you know, right. this $2,500 piece of equipment? Um, well, you've been selling, you know, $1,900 chlorinators um, for yeah. a long time because the consumer wanted it. Uh, you know, it, it's, you can, you learn to you create your sales pitch. Um, and, right. and then at the end of the day, another benefit to the builders is that now you, you also have pH balanced water and you have everything. And so you're losing a lot of those kind of issues as well about, right. you know, somebody putting too much acid in there and, uh, you know, stripping the copper in a heater and staining your plaster. Sure. I mean, it's, it, it solves a lot of problems for builders too. Right. Yeah. No, that's excellent. Uh, really yes. good point. And I think to the service point too, Dave, on Rockwell, we talk a lot about the training side, the education side, and educating yourself on how these automated systems work is important because if you take over a pool or whatever and you don't know how to work an automation system, you better figure that out. So that's important. And all the manufacturers provide that training for each individual yeah. product, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I think that's that part of it is still in its infancy. Dave and I, I visited a manufacturer that was promoting a, a, a chemical automation system and they were actually saying, oh, it's just for commercial systems. They, even they didn't see the need or the benefits of having it on a residential pool. Right. So there, there are manufacturers that do have systems that are um, geared toward the residential market. I think we're going to see more and more of it, but uh, I, I definitely encourage uh, pool service techs to to learn this technology, learn yep. uh, the benefits of it, learn how to operate these systems, learn how to maintain the water um, with one of these systems, and it'll be the best friend you've ever had, the best ally you've ever had servicing your pool. But yep. it's it's. Um, a discussion that needs to continue and, and a level of education and, and these things need to be promoted, I think, even more than they already are. Absolutely. I Thank think you it's so much, Terry. Oh, go ahead, Terry. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's, it's going to become a lot more prevalent as time goes on. And, yes. uh, you know, prices will start to come down. They'll become more affordable and it will, it will definitely be the wave of the future. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Terry. We appreciate having you on. We'll probably thank talk you. to you in the future. We come to you as an expert in many areas, chemistry related. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Stay I safe out there, the everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you guys. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Bye. Thanks, Dave and Dave. Thanks, Terry. Bye-bye.